Ladies and gentlemen, can you hear me? Very good. Welcome to Concordia. My name is Mangana Nakai, and it's a privilege to present this evening's program, the first in a series of public dialogues on current legal issues. This event is coordinated by the English and History Departments in support of the college's new pre-law program. We are grateful to the pre-law advisory board for guiding us in the process of structuring a fine curriculum for students who wish to pursue a career in law. You will find the names of our board members listed on the inside cover of the programs you just received at the door. The topic we have selected for this evening, is racial profiling ever justified, is not entirely new. From the atrocious practices of slavery, the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II, to the contemporary practices of DWA, driving while black, DWB, I'm sorry, or FWA, flying while Arab, racial profiling clearly robs individuals of the equal protection guaranteed by the Fourth Amendment. However, since the tragic mass murder of innocent civilians on September 11, advocates argue that during this time of horror, we must be vigilant in every way to protect our national security, even if it involves ethnic, racial, or religious profiling. Opponents of profiling Arabs, Muslims, or people of Middle Eastern descent argue that such a practice would only perpetuate the de facto profiling already practiced in the United States and that it might bring about another catastrophe in the aftermath of September 11. And thus the enduring question, is racial profiling ever justified? Is it necessary to abandon the American principles of liberty and due process in order to protect the US from terrorism? Benjamin Franklin once wrote, and I quote, they that can give essential liberty to obtain a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. I wonder what advice he would have given us today if he were around. This evening, we are grateful to our four panelists and moderator for contributing their time and expertise to enlighten us about this controversy. And now to introduce our friends, here is Dr. James Berkey, co-director with me of the pre-law program, chair of the history, languages, and religion department, and the proud father of a beautiful baby girl. I couldn't resist that. Thank you. Uh, we have before us tonight a very distinguished uh, group of participants representing a uh, really broad diversity of backgrounds uh, and viewpoints. So it should make for a fascinating discussion. We thank them for their participation tonight in what I know will be uh, a very enlightening and informative evening. They are starting at your left, the Reverend Dr. David Benke, uh, familiar to many of us here at Concordia. Uh, he is serving right now as pastor of St. Peter's Lutheran Church in Brooklyn and Chief Executive Officer of Lutheran Social Services. Uh, to his left is uh, Dr. Salim Mir. Dr. Mir is Director of Medicine at Phelps Memorial in Sleepy Hollow and President of the Westchester American Muslim Association. Uh, to your very right, we have Professor Bennett Gershman. Professor Ger Gershman is Professor of Constitu Constitutional Law at Pace University Law School. Uh, and uh, second from your right is Mr. Michael W. Cutler. Uh, Mr. Cutler is a retired senior special agent with the Immigration and Naturalization Service, the INS. Uh, and just a couple of weeks ago uh, was in Washington, D.C. testifying before Congress on Homeland Security. Uh, we're honored to have you all with us tonight. Moderating tonight's event 
is Mr. David Otis Fuller, Jr. Uh, Mr. Fuller uh, is a member of our pre-law advisory group, a justice in the village of Tuckahoe, and partner at Bosworth, Gray, and Fuller. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight. <laughs> Mr. Fuller. Thank you. Good evening. Let's get started. Is racial profiling ever justified? I'm going to start at my left, your right, with Professor Gershman, and he'll be devoting about five minutes to that topic to start with, giving us um, uh, some definitions, too, as to what he means or what he feels is meant by racial profiling. So I'll call on Professor Gershman to start us off. Thank you, Thank you David. Um, I, I just want to say how pleased I am to participate in this important program and, and with such a distinguished group of panelists. I suppose to start with, I, I think of racial profiling as the singling out of persons because of their race for uh, unfavorable treatment um, by government. Um, and, I, and I thought I would just try to highlight, uh, uh, to begin with, the three possible situations which try to directly answer the question, is racial profiling ever justified? One I think is fairly not controversial. The second example is a little bit controversial. And the third one I think is very controversial. The first um, situation um, where a person's race uh, may per appropriately be considered uh, is when it's relevant to an investigation. For example, singling out racial minorities for police stops uh, based on a victim's description does not suggest impermissible racial targeting. Uh, for in such cases, a suspect's race is used in the same manner as any other descriptive detail, uh, such as height, weight, or distinctive clothing. Uh, the second situation is, uh, would involve um, a case where uh, hypothetically, a border patrol agents on the Mexican-American border uh, are looking for persons who are in, trying to enter the United States illegally. And in that kind of a case, uh, the, the border agents might appropriately look at persons of apparent Mexican ancestry. Uh, now, that may raise uh, issues of racial profiling because it may appear that the police are, are unfairly targeting uh, the, these persons, um, but the Supreme Court has held that, uh, and I'm quoting, to the extent that the Border Patrol relies on apparent Mexican ancestry, that reliance is clearly relevant to the law enforcement need to be served. The third situation is very difficult, and I'm, I'm thinking back to a time when I was a prosecutor in the same office that uh, David Fuller was, and I remember at the beginning of my term in, as, a, as a public prosecutor, we were uh, assigned to go around the neighborhood up in Harlem with um, detectives from the 23rd Precinct. So we got into their car, it's an unmarked car, we drove around the neighborhood and the detectives very, would tell us where, which was a drug hangout and uh, which persons might be uh, up to no good. And I recall we, we, we moved uh, down 110th Street, and if any of you know Manhattan, Central Park starts at 110th Street and goes south. Fifth Avenue is on our left as we're heading south. And we're heading south on, uh, on Fifth Avenue and we get to about 97th Street, and, and 97th Street and 5th Avenue happens to be a very elegant neighborhood, uh, beautiful apartment houses, um, and, and as we're approaching, all of a sudden, we see a young African-American youth, 16, 17 years of age, darting across the street from the 5th Avenue side to the Central Park side. Uh, he's carrying some kind of a bag, a valise, and he immediately ra hails a cab, and the cab is in front of us, and the cab moves over to the park side. We in the police car the po drive to the side of the cab, pull the cab over, tell the cab to stop. Uh, the officers get out on each side of the car. They immediately go to the cab, they open the cab's door, they pull this kid out, they put him up against the uh, car, and they frisk him. This is called a stop and frisk. And they uh, find out, hey, what's in the bag? And this kid is terrified. Uh, you know, he, he mumbles uh, something, I think, gym stuff. And the police say, open it. And he opens it, and the police puts his hand in. First thing he pulls out is a crumpled, dirty T-shirt. And then he puts his hand in again. He pulls out a jock strap. <laughs> and he says to the kid, um, all right, uh, be on your way. Don't, and stay out of trouble. 
Um, now, I'm sure this event uh, may have scarred this kid for the rest of his life. It's possible. Um, what was in the police officer's mind? And you know, they, they did this to show us how, you know, what, what it's like being a police officer. What was in their mind? Well, maybe they were thinking, this kid is out of place. It's a white neighborhood, and, and, and a black kid running across the street, hailing a cab, carrying a bag in a white neighborhood, uh, there's something suspicious about that. Is it suspicious? Well, you know, I, I, I think to say it is, I think is immoral. I think it is uh, undemocratic. I think it is insidious, but you know, um, I have to say that some courts would say that that is an appropriate consideration. I'm just quoting from a, court, a state supreme court. Um, the fact that a person is obviously out of place in a particular neighborhood is one of several factors that may be considered by an officer in the court in determining whether an investigation and detention is reasonable and therefore lawful. I mean, we're talking about a subject that is very, very difficult. I mean, even assuming we know what racial profiling is, proving racial profiling, proving that government is impermissibly using race as opposed to other, let's assume, legitimate factors in their investigation is very difficult to prove. Uh, and, and I think maybe we'll, be, we'll talk about that a, a bit later. Um, but this is obviously a, a subject that is m much more momentous today than it was pre-9-11. You know, if you're an Ar Arab American, stay off the streets. Uh, at least some people say that. Um, so um, that's, uh, at least for now, uh, where, where I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I just had one question on that. Were, were any of the uh, detectives uh, African Americans? No. In this okay. Two white, both white. <coughs> okay. Good evening, everybody. I, I'm glad that I could join you tonight. I have a couple of prepared remarks, so I'll go ahead and do that. The Declaration of Independence of our nation proclaims that all men are created equal. Yet the goal of equal treatment under the law for all of our citizens has often gone unrealized. Our nation is certainly moving in the proper direction, but problems still remain. Today, racial profiling has come under fire for standing in the way of this very important goal. When the average person thinks about racial profiling, racism, bigotry, and disparate treatment immediately come to mind. Certainly, when civilians make broad decisions about people, based purely on race, ethnicity, religion, or national origin, all of the negative issues that such judgment calls brings to mind are appropriate. Consequently, I certainly understand why people have inherent misgivings about racial profiling. However, we must understand under what circumstances racial profiling has a legitimate role in law enforcement. In order to do this, I would begin by telling you what the INS guidelines are where, I, where uh, racial profiling are concerned. The INS tells its enforcement personnel that racial profiling is acceptable if it is based on reasonable suspicion, based on articulable facts, and these are then considered in conjunction with other issues. When a law enforcement officer stops an individual solely because of his or her race, as we just heard, then the officer most likely is wrong. However, if that officer is looking for a suspect in a crime, for example, and part of the description of the suspect being sought includes the race of the individual, then obviously the law enforcement officer must take race into account in conjunction with the rest of the description of the individual for whom the search is being conducted. In screening airline passengers at airports or vehicles at entrances to tunnels or bridges, a tactic often empl em uh, employed in the interest of national security, the issue of profiling gets a bit trickier. With a limited number of law enforcement officers available to staff checkpoints, each and every person or vehicle cannot be stopped, and therefore random stops are often implemented. Certainly, this practice avoids the problem of the appearance of racial profiling, but does it really work? Does rummaging through the pocketbook of an 80-year-old grandmother to search for nail clippers really prevent a hijacking? <coughs> Various tactics are often utilized in an effort to treat people fairly. Officers engage in such activities by perhaps stopping a random number of vehicles, such as every fifth car. This, again, may avoid the issue of racism, but is it effective? We certainly walk a delicate balance of traffic stops and then airport boarding gates, but how can we avoid the appearance of racism if we purely allow the officers to use their judgment? Our society in this day and age seems to abhor judgment calls made by people who are placed in positions of authority. Federal judges are encumbered by sentencing guidelines 
which place clear restrictions on their ability to make a judgment call when sentencing convicted felons, notwithstanding the fact that we call these people judges. I don't have an easy answer, but in this day of fears of terrorism versus concerns about allegations of racism, our law enforcement officers and our society are placed in a difficult position. We want our law enforcement officers to protect us from criminals and terrorists, yet we also need to make every reasonable effort to make certain that we treat all people fairly and equally. The state of New Jersey recently enacted legislation that prohibits law enforcement officers from engaging in racial profiling, deeming such action a felony with a maximum penalty of five years in jail, unless it was in the sort of case that I described before where a suspect being sought was identified by race. I understand the motivation for this legislation, but I also have some serious concerns about it. Put yourself in the position of a state trooper who's on patrol looking for motorists who are violating the law by speeding or committing other such violations of the vehicle and traffic law. Virtually everyone on roads, such as the New Jersey Turnpike, drives above the speed limits when the conditions permit. Generally, people love cops until they're pulled over by one. What would prevent a motorist who has stopped for speeding from claiming that the other cars in his or her vicinity were actually driving faster than he was, and therefore, he was stopped because of his race? How would that officer defend his action? I suspect that most police officers in this climate would be reluctant to make such a stop for fear of what might follow, placing him and his career in jeopardy. The fear of being prosecuted for doing his job can certainly have a chilling effect on the way that a law enforcement officer carries out his duties. We must do everything reasonable to prevent discrimination and despair treatment, especially by members of our law enforcement organizations. But we need to make certain that the cure isn't worse than the disease. Thank you. <clears throat> I just had one question uh, on the items that uh, Mr. The Professor Gershman mentioned. Um, do you have, is your position essentially the same as his, that is to say the investigation is all right, the border is probably all right, mm -hmm. but, but having um, uh, a, a, an African American in a neighborhood that's essentially white, uh, that that would uh, be a grounds for stopping the person would be bad. I mean, did you, are you pretty much in, in? It's an uncomfortable position. You know, over the years I've worked as part of a task force. Since 1988, I worked with uh, with the various narcotics organizations. And in fact, I became part of the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force in 1991. And we work with police officers and the FBI and DEA, uh, customs, and, and even foreign governments. But the thing is that when it's done where it's obvious that the only reason someone's being stopped is because of color and no other reason, I have to tell you, I was uncomfortable with it. Because we go back to the issue of fairness. We go back to why are you making the stop. The fact that somebody was running and acting furtively, to me, would, would get my antenna up regardless of color. Maybe the kid was late. That's entirely possible. I will tell you one thing, and I don't want to take up too much time at, at the beginning of this. When I was a kid, I managed to uh, buy a Jag Roadster at a really great price. I was 23 years old, and that car must have had some kind of a magnet that attracted police cars. Every time they saw a 23-year-old kid, and I was an immigration officer, by the way, after a while, and I, I was getting pulled over regularly. I suspect I was stopped maybe once every two months driving along 45 miles an hour on the Belt Parkway in the right lane, pull over. What did I do? Pull over. And what I did was I was driving while young. I was driving a flashy car while young. I don't know what the initials are. <laughs> but what police officers look for are those things that call your attention to them. And I can tell you as an agent, that's really one of the things you look for. What is it that I'm seeing that kind of sticks out? You know, you kind of play a game of where's Waldo? And what you're looking for is, is something happening here that's out of place? If you go to the supermarket and you see all the cans of soup and somebody stuck a bottle of ketchup on that shelf, your eyes are drawn to the ketchup. It's racism if you allow your official position to be twisted by an inherent prejudice that you may have. It's not racism to my thinking if you see that ketchup bottle that's, that's on the wrong shelf. The fact that the kid was running, the time of day, there's a lot of, a lot of variables that go into that kind of a judgment call. But I will also tell you, I have seen police officers simply stop somebody for being the wrong color. And that's something that I have a big problem with. I hope I answered the question. No, I think you did. Thank you. It's Dr. Mayor. 
I must admit that the credentials of the panelists here today are so intimidating that I find myself somewhat out of place to uh, speak on this forum, but I'm, nevertheless, I'm here to make a case before you, ladies and gentlemen, because being a physician, I feel that I have most of the time my fingers on the pulse of most of the Americans. And I understand their feelings, particularly in these times. I am here before you to speak about the fundamental rights of an individual laid down in the Declaration of Independence <coughs> and the Constitution of the United States of America. These rights are so much ingrained in our daily life that they cannot and should not be sacrificed for the sake of expediency. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These principles have been a beacon of light, a source of inspiration, and a hope for millions of people all across the globe who look towards America as the embodiment of these ideals. Our deep commitment as a nation to these basic rights, these, our commitment as a nation to these basic rights has helped us in shaping our path whenever we deviated from these moral values. It helped us to admit our wrong done to our citizens of Japanese descent in the Second World War, when Japanese Americans were imprisoned in our notorious concentration camps for their guilt to look alike our enemies in Japan. In the heat of war, and fueled by our hatred towards Nazi Germany, Americans of German descent were the target of scorn and suspicion during the Second World War in America. This was wrong. There were Americans of German descent who had sympathy towards Nazi Germany, but others who were equally loyal were the victims of our wrath. In fact, guilt by association was implied. In 1942, eight Nazi Germany agents, all German Americans who lived in America for long stretches of time, landed in Long Island, New York, with instructions to destroy American power <coughs> plants, factories, tunnels, and bridges. They were apprehended by FBI, tried and convicted by the military court. Guess who tipped the FBI? It was one of those eight persons, terrorist, who was in fact an American patriot, who had set on that mission with the intent of whispering it to the ears of FBI. These are some, there are some who quoting the doctrine of necessity in the light of the events of 9-11, insist on the justification of racial profiling. This because on the face value, it seems to work. There are long lines at the airports, endless body and luggage searches, reaching hair-splitting details. Yet, rich Richard Reed, half West Indian, half Englishman, with a British passport, escaped the scrutiny at the airport. According to Stephen Flynn of the Council of Foreign Relations, what we need is not profiling, <coughs> but smart profiling. What we need is cooperation of the American Muslim communities to spot out elements of suspicious behavior and to work with law enforcement agents to report any would-be miscreants in a timely manner. There are about six to seven million Muslims living in America. The vast majority of immigrant Muslims came to America not only to earn a decent livelihood, but above all, to share the riches of American liberty and freedom 
which are enshrined in our Constitution and are the core of American life. This minority of Muslims is melting into the vast American society and serving our communities as doctors, teachers, and scientists, and so on. The American Muslims who, whose cooperation would be essential in preventing acts of terrorism cannot be alienated because it would hurt our government's ability to form good relations with this group and get vital information. David Harris, an authority on racial profiling, says that race is too broad a category to be useful. If you focus on race, the eye is distracted from behavior and moves to what is literally skin deep. Vincent Canistaro, former head of counterterrorism at CIA, explains that racial profiling is bad information. It is a false lead. It may be intuitive to stereotype people, but profile is too crude to be effective. I cannot think of any example where profiling has caught a terrorist, unquote. If you are looking for a needle in a haystack, adding hay is not going to help, says James Zogby, an Arab American activist. I would like to state that justice cannot be bartered for simplistic safety in times of war. As justice delayed is justice denied, we as a nation cannot and should not sacrifice the very principles which are the core of the spirit of American liberty and freedom for all. We must remember the words of Benjamin Franklin. They that can give up essential liberty to obtain little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Ladies and gentlemen, nothing is politically right which is morally wrong. And I firmly believe, like many of you, that racial profiling is not justified anywhere, anytime, and not in America. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mir. I wanted to ask you if you or your acquaintances had any, have had any experience or know any examples of, of where uh, Muslim Americans have been unfairly, uh, unfairly treated or there's been uh, racial profiling in that respect. Are you familiar with any of those that you could share with us? Yes. Uh, a very famous physician in Westchester who gets referrals from all over the world was recently interrogated by two FBI agents. And they interviewed him for two hours. The questions were, are you a Muslim? He said, yes, I am. Do you pray? He said, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Then the questions were, did you ever write a letter to the INS authorities to help a person, a sick person, come to the United States of America. He said, yes, I do. I get referrals from all over the globe. And you know, if I find somebody who needs to come to America to, come, to have treatment, I write letters. He was interviewed for two hours. Then that was not enough. Few days later, two more agents came. And they were interviewing him for the same reason, just because he happens to be a Muslim, not knowing that he is serving our communities and doing an excellent job in helping the patients all over the globe. Thank you. Yes, Reverend Doctor, thank you. Thank you. Great and stimulating words so far. And I'd like to just say that if you ask a man to speak from a religious perspective about racial profiling at this time and in this moment in history, you're, you're giving a, uh, you're sticking a match in the hand of a guy who has a stick of dynamite. Uh, it's a very dangerous topic because religion 
and its impulse have provided, I believe, some of the highest and most noble efforts in the understanding of the fundamental equality of human beings, and at the same time provide the grounds for most of the violence that is taking place in an organized way in the world today. And we have to live with that. People of religious background and faith have to live with that tension. And we have to try, I believe, to, try to ferret through exactly what it is about our religious impulse that is valid and noble and that which needs to be discarded. Uh, I can say to you that <coughs> equality before Almighty God is something that is not only guaranteed by the Constitution, but is guaranteed by the Bible. <laughs> and it states quite plainly, as St. Paul says, we are all offspring of the same God. And in the image of God, he created them at the beginning of the world. And that was not a racial discriminator in that. And that each and every one of us, from whatever religious background here tonight, I believe would say that our faith, whether it be Jewish, Muslim, or Christian, if the, the three basic ones that are here tonight, would say that our religious background commands us to treat all people as human. Because God is no respecter of, per of persons, as the book of Acts tells us. At the very same time, the intolerant and the most absolutist points of view have prevailed in much religious thought and action throughout the world, throughout history, and have ended up causing the death of, of literally millions and millions of people for religious reasons. We're all up here today, tonight as cousins, children of Abraham, uh, Jesus, followers of Jesus, followers of Israel, follow, uh, uh, descendants rather of Israel, descendants of Ishmael, all relatives, and yet for some reason have chosen to wreak the most uh, vicious havoc upon one another. The curse of Ham was used by the apartheid government for the entire course of that, of that uh, wicked racial rule as a biblical grounds. It was, it was biblically grounded to treat black people as not people. Uh, not just to separate, but non-white people are not people, and may be treated as slaves or as automatic inferiors. So the noble impulse here, which is to say that we are all equal in the eyes of God, and God has, has created us that way, has been something that has been debased by the very same people practicing their religious impulse. And then I, I need to say tonight as well, from the religious standpoint, that the Bible is quite clear, if I use that as my lodestone, to say that government is instituted by God, that government is something that comes from God. And the rationale and the reason for government, the fundamental reason in Romans chapter 13, is that government is to be a terror to evildoers. It is to hem in that which is evil and unjust. It is to promote justice and be a terror to those who are evildoers. And the question then, because there, there are t several questions that immediately transpire. One is, what about when there are terrorists? How does the government become a terror to terrorists? And the second question, the correlative is, when does the government become the terrorist? Uh, because those are, those are two sides of the same coin. And so it is hard because religion is so close to the human, the center of the human heart, and is not simply an exercise in academics uh, to program in every religious response. And that's why people act so passionately upon their religious beliefs. Uh, and, and I can tell you that as one who sat here in this very room at the funeral of Ronald Bucca, who was the fire marshal who was killed one of the most heroic people killed on 9-11, and walked out of, that, out of this place filled with, with a sense of awe at, at God's love in that person's heart, but also filled with anger. And then trying to find a way, as a human being and as a religiously motivated person, to deal with that anger and deal with it appropriately, and not deal with it in some inappropriate religion, religious or racial way, is a difficult task. And that's why racial profiling, to me, it becomes a very difficult task, is because for all the noble motive of treating everyone equally, <coughs> not using race as a motivator, 
There's something underneath that that goes into our hearts and in anger or in, in a, a half-thought-through moment. Reactivity takes over. So I would like to say today, that uh, tonight, that when we discuss this from a religious point of view in terms of society's response, we're getting at the heart of what I see as some of the global problems in the area of racial profiling and in the area of racial mistreatment. Thank you very much. Dr. Benke, are you aware of any current <coughs> governmental practices uh, in the area of racial profiling that you feel uh, would be unacceptable to a religious person? Certainly, uh, many of them would be. Well, what, what, no, what are the ones I mean, that, are in, that are in force now or that you're aware of that, that happen now? Well, I, I, I'm sure there are various religious groups that are, are upset about what happens at the U.S. borders uh, because some of it involves people who are, are picked out uh, for racial reasons uh, who have no, with no other cause than that. I think that's one right there. And I think the other one is just the Arab community. And, and uh, I represent a denomination which has people who are Palestinian Christians who, who, who then also come under the same auspices because they're Arab uh, of, of uh, what I would say religious mistreatment for racial reasons. In other words, they're seen as Arabs, therefore they are, they're put into the same brush. So there you have a, a, a double whammy. Uh, and I believe then what we have found in Lutheran Disaster Response, I'm the co-chair of that, is that the first people that came to us for help were the, was the Muslim community. Because it said, they, they said to us right away that you are a religious-based organization that is not going to discriminate against us because we're Muslim. You're going to reach out to us and help us run our schools when we're afraid to send our kids to those schools. <coughs> I'd like to ask uh, Ben Gershman, uh, are you aware of any practices now, or do you feel there are any practices now by the Immigration and Naturalization Service that you feel are, are um, either unconstitutional or, or uh, illegal? Um, well, let, let me just uh, take a step back if I can. Um, I, I approach the question that we're discussing tonight um, from largely from a constitutional or legal standpoint. Uh, racial profiling is an example of racial discrimination. Um, and we can look at it as a political problem, as a moral problem, or as a legal constitutional problem. I, I teach constitutional law, and, um, I, and this, I teach civil rights and civil liberties and so on. I'm, 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 I think about this a lot, and I teach this. Um, I, I, and, I, and, I, and I think this is one of the most difficult questions, at least from, from a, a constitutional standpoint, because I think, it, it's, uh, I think the remedies are very difficult to, 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 to um, create here. Um, and um, you know, if you're interested, we can talk about that. Do I know of any uh, examples of racial profiling by the INS? Well, yes, of course there are. Um, we know post 9-11, uh, the INS rounded up uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uh, Arab, Arab, persons of Arab you know, heritage. I mean, we know, that, you know and, and, and they were detained, and they were questioned, and they were detained, and sometimes detained without any friends or relatives even knowing about it. Um, and gradually, some of the information came out, and gradually they released some of them. They deported many of them. Uh, some of them are still detained. Um, and, uh, you know, the problem is uh, when you're dealing with the threat of terrorism and the horrible uh, events of recent years, um, a lot of people probably will, ha will say this is unfortunate, it's uh, um, probably unconstitutional, illegal, but justified. Mm -hmm. Why do I say unconstitutional, illegal, but justified? Because I think in these situations, you know, the, the whole purpose of the system of law is to provide remedies if your rights are violated. And if you are stopped, detained, arrested without any justification, um, you know, the, the law tries to provide remedies. But in many of these cases, um, you know, the police, the INS, they're not thinking about what's going to happen later on in the court of law. They're thinking about 
stopping people who might be up to no good and to heck with uh, uh, courtrooms later on. It's sort of like the end justifies the means. If the end is to protect our safety from terrorists, anything goes, whether it's torture of persons in Guantanamo, whether it's stopping and detaining people without benefit of a lawyer, whether it's detaining people without their families and friends even knowing about it. This is seen, I think, by much of American law enforcement today, and maybe by many of you, as, as justified because of the threats that we face and because of this kind of idea that the, 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 the threat is so horrible and so dangerous that we, are, we want our police to protect us any way they can. So, I mean, I, 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 now, you know, that's my sense of, of where we are today. I can talk about it in, in, a, in a constitutional sense and tell you what the constitutional and legal rules are. But I'm not so sure that that's all important today. If you're interested in that, you know, we can talk about it. But really, to take the, the rules are skewed in favor of government today, far more than they were two or three years ago. Mm. And they're getting more and more uh, skewed in favor of government, in favor of law enforcement. Is that a good thing? I don't know. Maybe it is and maybe it isn't. But that's where we are today. Mr. Cutler, your comment. Sure. Um, first of all, um, I understand that as a doctor, in more than one way, you have the finger on the pulse of the people that are around you. Um, and that's a good thing. And I understand that people confide in you um, about things that concern them. For example, the colleague who was sending letters of invitation to patients to come to the United States. When I testified before Congress, one of the things that struck me and has bothered me for a very long time is that we don't have a meaningful interior enforcement program. We have fewer than 2,000 INS special agents to cover the interior of the United States. Now that the INS has merged with customs, we add those customs agents to the roles of those people who will carry out interior enforcement, but they've also got to carry out the customs enforcement program. As an interim move, I understand that the Marshal Service and the FBI have been given authority to enforce Title VIII, which is that segment of law that concerns uh, immigration enforcement. Now, the problem that we have is it's estimated right now that there are perhaps upwards of 12 million illegal aliens living within our borders. I will also tell you that I was assigned to the Drug Enforcement Administration for several years over at the Unified Intelligence Division. I did a study, and we found that in New York, over 60% of the people arrested by DEA were identified as foreign-born. Nationwide, it's about 30%. So while it's a very small percentage of the alien population that gets involved with crime, a disproportionate percentage of our criminal population is comprised of aliens. And that in and of itself is a matter of concern and of increasing concern because often monies raised by criminals flow back into terrorist and other criminal organizations. <laughs> One of the ways that people come into the United States is running the border. And everyone heard about the Border Patrol. But let me tell you, probably 50% of the illegal aliens who live in the United States today did not run the border. They entered the United States through a port of entry. The 19 terrorists who did quite a number on us on September 11th did not run the border. They came here through a port of entry. If I gave you a choice as to how to come to the United States, one way is to run the border, deal with possibly corrupt federales and the bandits and the inhospitable climate and rattlesnakes and so forth down on the Mexican border, or get a passport under an assumed identity, get a letter of invitation from a doctor that's fraudulent, stroll through an airport, make your way to the car of a waiting Confederate or a taxi cab, and go anywhere you want in the United States while wearing a three-piece suit having sipped wine and listened to music as you flew into our country, I think we know the way you'd rather get here. The FBI agents, or perhaps they were INS agents, who questioned the doctor you're describing, were apparently concerned with the possibility that people were getting letters of invitation to receive treatment in our country because of a medical condition. I will tell you, having worked fraud investigations and terrorist investigations, that there are instances where doctors, intentionally or unintentionally, issue letters. I worked a case where somebody walked into a doctor's office and stole a package of his personal stationery. 
and we wound up with literally hundreds of drug traffickers all purporting to be patients of this doctor. We went to interview the doctors. I don't know any of these people. And when you looked at the quality of the letters, you realized that the typewriter that he had didn't match the type style on the letter. And then there are doctors who unfortunately do the wrong thing for one reason or another. I wasn't there for the interview. I don't know precisely what was said or what wasn't said. And the doctor, I'm sure, was never told what prompted the visit to his office to find out. But I could certainly, as an agent, having done this job for 30 years, I could imagine a situation where you wind up with several people who are either suspicious or of proven terrorist connection or criminal connection who entered with a letter from a doctor. The first <coughs> thing you want to do is go back to the person that authored the letter to find out if A, it was legitimate, and if B, the person had any idea of what was going on. And you certainly wouldn't tell the guy, gee whiz, we just locked up four terrorists and they said you gave him the letter. But you would go to the guy and say, have you issued letters? And this is the way that an investigation is conducted. I don't want to take up too much time, but I want to make one real fast point. ABC News yesterday, on its news magazine program, spoke about how racial profiling was employed where FBI agents fanned out and interviewed Iraqi or people of Iraqi background and wanted to know what they knew and that sort of thing. Knocking on someone's door and saying to them, you come from a country that we're currently at war with, where we believe there may be a nexus with terrorism. Can you provide us with information? To my thinking, is no different from a cop who knocks on your door and says, there was a shooting four hours ago when you home, did you hear anything? If you think someone has information for you and you don't threaten the person, and you don't say either you tell us or we're gonna arrest you, if it's done in a non-confrontational manner, and I will tell you, we all operate that way because the final thing that uh, the gentleman seated to my left, your right, stated, was that we've basically thrown everything out and you know it's a freewheeling situation. I happen to be Jewish. I lost most of my family to the Holocaust. I'm named for my dead grandmother who died during the Holocaust. Many people are immigrants who work for the INS. We're mindful of people's rights, and if we weren't inherently mindful, you're certainly mindful about Bivens' actions, where you could be sued for exceeding your legal authority. Does it mean that people don't do the wrong thing? No, people do the wrong thing every day of the week in every walk of life. Doctors, teachers, law enforcement personnel, um, the guy down at the corner butcher store selling you lousy meat. I mean, everybody is subject to being wrong. But there are constraints placed on those people who go off the deep end and do things they ought not be doing, and we're all very mindful of it. So we're not the enemy. Federal agents, you know, we're part of the community. We're part of the country. We're not floating somewhere out here off in left field. This is our country as much as it's your country. And we go to work and do our job every day the way everybody else does the job, except our responsibility is to try to make this world a little bit safer for all of us. Would you like to add? To yeah, I'd like to uh, <coughs> respond to this. Number one, I. You, you know better than I do that a simple letter from a doctor is not the reason why the visa will be granted to any person coming from abroad. This Could is be. only one of the tons of information that is obtained uh, one after another, do doctor's reports from the country, countries of origin, police report, their investigative report, their interviews that are done at the embassies. And then only after that, the visa may be granted to that person to come here to the United States to, uh, to, to, to get the treatment. Uh, so I, I don't think that, that it is as simple as, you know, uh, we would like to, we were made to believe that it is one letter that will do the job. Number two, uh, I would say that it is, it is not only this, this was only one of the examples. I have one colleague who had an office, a medical office, who had rented from um, a place, a office a place, and he was their tenant for 16 years. No problem ever paying the rent on time. All of a sudden, the things changed. 9-11 event, you know, he got a notice that you, will have, you are going to be evicted from this place because of no reason were given. So he went to the uh, landlord, he asked, what's the problem? Have I done anything wrong? They looked at him, they said, well, we have some plans. So he said, what are the plans? You know, he said, we, don't, we can't divert the information to you. 
So at the end of the you know, month, they gave him a month's time to get out. He finally vacated the office. Two months later, the same office was rented to another two doctors. Now, one wonders if this is not some kind of racial discrimination, what else could it be? Because there was no legitimate reason for him to be a victim. So I'm, I'm, I'm just, what I'm just giving you a couple of examples. What I need you know you, you to understand that when wrong is being done, and people, fair-minded people, do not speak out, then the wrong will prevail. And I think that's what we got to do. If something wrong is being done, we got to stand up and say it is wrong. Thank you. Before we uh, open this up to the uh, audience, <coughs> something you would like to say? Uh, yeah, I'd like to say two things. One is that uh, I spent, uh, speak to the younger audience here, I spent most of my adult life in uh, East New York, Brooklyn. And uh, in my experience, it was very simple, that I could have walked down the street in my neighborhood as a white guy with an ax in my hand, and they just said, Father, you have a nice day. Whereas if you're black, if you're Latino, you were going to get the beat down in my neighborhood. You were going to get the beat down over there. And that, and that little differential often made the difference between a child finishing school or dropping out of school, giving up or pushing on. And my, my belief was that the religious institution then, where, where when we saw that injustice taking place, where religious institutions by and large are the most segregated institutions in the country, in, in the society. The most segregated hour of the week is 11 o'clock Sunday morning. Uh, we had to take the, the bull by the horns, we had to take the reins and say we will promote uh, interracial uh, conversation, we will promote interracial con congregations, and we will also promote, at this time, interfaith dialogue. That if, that if people of religious value and faith, I've, I've taken the beat down <laughs> for, for hanging out with people like you and, uh, uh, at, at Yankee Stadium. Uh, and, uh, and in so doing, you know, I found out that it was intolerance of my own folk for me who said you should not be hanging around with a man like that. And I said, this, is, this was at Yankee Stadium after 9-11, when I was praying, and I, and I said, if we're not gonna stand together as common humanity and pray for healing at a time like this, what good is our religion anyway? <laughs> but I'll tell you what it calls for. You see, it calls for us to be courageous enough to take on that kind of dialogue, to take on dialogue that will end up showing not only our similarities but our differences, right? And some of them being fundamental and deep on a religious level. And then understanding that just because there is different doesn't mean we go to war, doesn't mean we pick up a gun, doesn't mean we, we persecute. And, and uh, I would say that's gonna be what my life's all about and, and, and I certainly hope that the younger, the, the students here take up that kind of banner because that's how you're going to make a difference. Any uh, brief rejoinders before we open it up to the audience? Yes, yes go ahead. Um, I know that Dr. Muir was talking about how difficult it is to get a visa. There was a young lady that I testified with, or perhaps I should say against, uh, back in 1997 by the name of Mary Ryan, who was the Under Secretary of State for Councilor Affairs. All of the councilor offices throughout the world were under her direction. And she came up with this wonderful program, and I say it sarcastically, called the Visa Express. And what it meant, and it's not a credit card, folks, so we're not spending money. Uh, what it had to do with was they would rush the visa process through. And I know of several people who were able to get passports and assumed identities in various countries, including Russia and in the Middle East as well, and they would bring the, pa they'd get the passport, from a guy at the, through the travel agency, let me back up, the travel agent would have a friend at the passport office who was corrupt. And a local passport official would issue a passport in a whole new name. This was kind of like their own unofficial witness protection program. We get rid of Ivan the Terrible, he goes back to Russia, goes to a guy at a travel agent, says, yeah, I want to go back to America, but I can't. They say, no problem. They get him a passport with his photo that says he's Peter the Great. 
They then take the passport over to the State Department. State Department looks at this, they run the name through the computer. Guess what? No record because it's a fictitious identity. They issue him a visa without ever even seeing him, without fingerprinting him, without interviewing him. Yes, they ran the name through the criminal indices, but if it's a fictitious name, <laughs> you know it comes back with no criminal history. So it's not as hard as people might imagine to get a visa to come here. And that's what the problem is. We used to have tight controls. Mary Ryan came along and said, we're going to evaluate our people on how fast they issue visas. This is Lucy at the Bonbon bon factory. How quickly can we crank these things out? So they were bringing boxes of passports over to the embassy. And the embassy was stamping away like crazy, saying, here's your passport. And these people were hopping on airplanes. And we had to clean up the mess afterwards. So I, I'm sorry to disagree with you, but having the inside knowledge that I have, and there were hearings that I participated in that focused on that <coughs> problem, we were giving them away faster than people wanted them. We were giving them the keys to the kingdom, and there were very little things done to make certain that the people that we allowed in should have been allowed in. And now we're trying to clean up some of the mess that's, fl that's flowed from that. Thank you. All right, now we come to an exciting time, and that is when er anyone out here who has a question Please raise your hand. There'll be a, a microphone brought to you. You may ask your question. Who has the first question? All these students here that know. Oh, they're all walking to the door. <laughs> yeah, right. You, uh, yes, up there. You, can you bring the microphone to this gentleman up here? Thank you. I have a question from Mr. Cutler. Okay. Um, how do you feel? Um, we talked earlier about um, the number of immigrants that are in this country illegally. How do you feel about that we're one of the only countries in the world that do not use the army or the military to regulate the borders? Well, I think what we're seeing now is there is some involvement of the military on the border to augment the border patrol. I don't like the idea of having military do law enforcement. The perspective of the military is very different from the perspective of an agent. Even when we put on our battle gear and go out and take a door down, we're not there to shoot anybody. We're there to take people into custody. Shooting is the last thing you want to do. The military orientation is a bit different. However, when you realize that there's 8,000 miles of border between the Mexican border and the Canadian border, and then you've got the seacoast, I think it's inevitable that at least until things get settled down and we have more manpower available, that we will use the military to assist us. I just think that we have to be very, very careful on what their marching orders are, uh, because I don't want to see tragedies. I also want to make one point. I don't think the aliens are enemy. When you go to work as an immigration agent, you're going to work to enforce the laws. It's not me against them. It's me making certain that the laws that regulate aliens' rights to be in the United States are properly enforced. So I have mixed feelings, but I, I do know what's being done now is put under the broad category, necessary evil, I guess. Right, right down, uh, right over here. <coughs> there is a difference between private and public demonstration of racial uh, discrimination. Just because the private sector can irresponsibly handle it, as they've demonstrated with uh, numerous other issues, does not mean the government and the public sector, which has much stricter guidelines, cannot lawfully and use this beneficially for the safety of the general public. Uh, does the fact that the few, misuses, the few misuse this ability justify the overall usefulness to the responsible? Is that uh, it, it, it's one you want for to just the panel in general? Right. Anyone want to try that one? We yeah, all. I'll do that. I, I don't want to monopolize this. You know, we have something called, and, and I know that the professor seated on my left will, will, will tell you about the exclusionary rule, um, the fruit of poisonous trees. If you, if you gather evidence improperly, the evidence can't be used in court. If you do something that's inappropriate as a law enforcement officer, you should be made to pay a price for that, if it can be shown. And that, that was my concern. If you can show that it was the intent to use your authority improperly. And you know, there's a lot of interpretation. Why did somebody do something? We go to motivation, and you could really get into a heck of a quagmire trying to figure out what caused somebody to do what they did at a particular moment. But if you have somebody who has a pattern of that kind of conduct, then he needs to be removed from the job. I have no tolerance 
for a, a person with a badge breaking the law. I think that when you have a badge, you're more accountable, not less accountable. And I've, I've often told colleagues if I had a problem with them, I would say to them, hey, you know what? You're going to win those individual battles, but in the end, you're going to lose the war. And this was years ago, before we thought of, of Iraq or anything else. So I think we, when you put a badge on, you have to understand the responsibility that goes with it. And if you have somebody that doesn't understand the responsibility or defies that responsibility, then that person should be removed. But you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think that you need to have internal controls. But as I differentiated, if you're using racial profiling and only in conjunction with a host of other identifiers, components, and issues, activity, where the person was, how they responded, and all these other intangibles, then I think it's appropriate. All right, who's next? There. Oh, she's going to get arrested. Yeah, the yeah, this is for the, uh, the Reverend. Um, as a New Yorker, do you feel kind of pressured? Because uh, you know you said it's from a religious uh, point that you, f that you feel that it's inappropriate for you to racial profile. But as a New Yorker, someone who's lived through September 11th, do you feel that it's, you kind of get pressured by, by your peers to, by when you, you know, you say when you hang out with uh, people of different eth ethnic backgrounds? Yeah, uh, and I think that's exactly where people of religious uh, belief belong right now. Is you belong, you belong against the grain. You don't want to just uh, stay with your own and stay in your own little box right now. This is the, exactly the time to push out the boundary a little bit and start to explore what it is that produces that other guy's, that other person's faith. Uh, uh, because I, I believe in the overwhelming majority of cases, you're going to find it's the same kind of thing let's say from my Christian standpoint, that's at the core value of the Muslim and Jewish uh, faith. If I, if I only stick with my own, my, my tendency would be to, to just look at somebody on the basis of race or religion and say I'm not, I'm not from that. That's why this is the time primarily to do two things. Listen, A, uh, instead of always talking, which we clergy kind of guys do, uh, and B, to begin to articulate that faith from a more inclusive way than an exclusive way. Every religious claim, nobody says, I belong to the third best religion. You know, who says that? <coughs> so I'm, I'm happy to be the third finest religion in the world. Now, nobody says that. They say, mine is the true religion. I understand what, who God is. Uh, so you can't deny the right of a person to give an exclusive claim to their faith. They're going to say, uh, the Christian is going to say, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So that's the way the Christian is going to come across with that. But that, that doesn't have to be done in a narrow and bigoted way. See, it's, it's how, how that's done that I think is critical right now. So that's a really good question. Did you want to say something? No, I'd like to add on, on, on this. Uh, I'd like to see uh, the, the silver lining on the, on the dark clouds. And even after the 9-11 event, one thing that has really come out of that is a real need in our communities to have an interfaith dialogue. Um, as a result of the, uh, right after 9-11, lots of communities invited us to come and speak to them about what Islam is all about. And as a result of that dialogue, a center of Jewish, Christian, Muslim understanding was formed in Arts, uh, rather Hivrington. And that has gone out to educate and present before the public and the, and, the, and the communities what these three religions are are about. What are the things that you know the majority of the Muslims you know believe? Majority of the Muslims do not believe in these acts of terrorism. We do believe, as you know, <coughs> Banki has said, that you know all children are we are all children of God, children of Abraham, having some common bonds between us, some differences that differentiate us as to what we do. But if you look at the very basics of the, of the, of the three faiths, I think there are more things that bind us than, than which are separating us. So more dialogue is needed, more understanding is needed, and we, we encourage all of us, and Muslim community particularly, that they, are, they have to go out and be with the communities where they live in, be part of the social services that are being rendered 
in the community. I've been personally been involved in many, many mm. organizations. Uh, we had it, you know, for several years ago, five years ago, we started a program with the children, eight to nine years, eight to 12 years old children who have not had any kind of prejudices against anybody. They have not developed it. They're raw minds. So we get Jewish, Christians, and Muslim children to sit for three consecutive Sundays and get together and share their beliefs, share the rituals and customs with one another. And this has been a very, very successful program that we started in Croton. All right, now in the audience, are there any people who feel threatened? Well, here's a question right here. I was just going to ask to try to see if there are people who feel that the, the society we're in right now it threatens them somehow. Go right ahead. It seems to me that um, the issue of racial profiling is really more of a conflict between individual rights versus national responsibility to protect every, ind every individual in that state. Um, my question to specifically Mr. Cutler and uh, Dr. Mir, but I'm happy to hear any, anybody else's response is, when is it, um, when can we really say that it is less important for a government to protect every individual in its state than it is to ensure the rights of certain select individuals? When is it less important? When is it less important for, for, like, for example, United States of America, when is it less important for our government to uh, protect every person here um, than it is to protect the certain rights of select individuals in this country? Well, I think that, you know, it, it's a funny thing, but you, as I say, you walk a tightrope. You go to work in the morning. My goal isn't to, even though it's immigration, pardon the pun, we're not there to alienate people. We're not trying to see how many people we can demean or insult. One of the practices INS did a long time ago that I had a real moral problem with, what we used to call street stops. Uh, you're probably too young to remember this because this was done 15, 20 years ago. But what happened was we would jump out of our cars if we were in a neighborhood that was known to have a high density of illegal aliens. We would stop people on subway platforms at bus stops because we knew they were going to work and we would ask for identifications. Talk about an image of, of, of the Holocaust and where are your papers kind of thing. I will tell you, it troubled me. And I did everything in my power to avoid being out there involved with those field operations. And I started going after criminal aliens long before the INS focused on it. I was working with police officers in a bunch of precincts, chasing down aliens involved in drug trafficking and armed robberies and, and, and gun trafficking. So when we do that sort of thing, we are diminished as a country, we're diminished as a people. Okay. And that's not what I ever wanted to do. But on the other hand, if you have people who come to our country, they're guests in our house, so to speak, and they do damage to us, they get involved with criminal activity, they do that sort of thing, they need to be stopped. You know, I, when I testified before Congress a couple of weeks ago, one of the things we talked about was this rape of a woman in Queens by five Ill illegal aliens, or four illegal aliens and one resident alien. And I said that the best thing that law enforcement can do isn't to solve a crime, it's to prevent a crime. I don't want to solve murders, I'd rather prevent the murder. But you don't prevent anything if you're not a deterrent, and you're not a deterrent if you're not effective. So again, we're constantly at a quandary of how far is too far? How far isn't far enough? So as I told you from the outset, if I stop you because you're a black guy in a white neighborhood, that's wrong. Because I can't imagine a white guy getting stopped for being in a black neighborhood, okay? But if I add to the fact that you're not typical of the community, let's put me or you or whoever in Chinatown, and everything is okay, I'm dressed sort of okay, but as soon as I see a police car, I duck behind a parked car. Now the antenna has to go up. The guy is acting furtively. If you're using it as part of an overall description, then it's legitimate to say, well, what's that guy doing? Why is he hiding there? He doesn't blend into the community, and he sees a police car, and he's ducking. What's up? But if I simply see you walking along, and I say, well, this is a white neighborhood. That's a black guy. I'm going to pull him over. That is 100% wrong, 100%. And not only should you feel violated, as an agent, I would have felt violated. I hope I answered your question. Yes. Uh, I just want to make a couple of brief comments on uh, Mr. Cutler's uh, comments. <clears throat> um, when, I, when I hear statements like, this person is not typical in the community, or he's not blending into the community, 
Right away, we're talking about stereotypes. You know what stereotypes are, right? A stereotype is, is exactly that. You don't belong here, or you see a, a black person, and right away, you get worried. You know, um, and, and we all have stereotypes. We all see things through that kind of lens. Um, and, I, and, I, and I wonder about how these stereotypes are, are applied by our law enforcement agents. For example, there was a recent case in the Supreme Court uh, where uh, the police, the, the Supreme Court said that it was all right for the police when they're in a minority neighborhood and they're clearly visible as police officers to stop and frisk a young black kid when upon seeing the police, he engages in furtive conduct, he runs, he flees, okay? Now let's just talk about that for a second. Does flight by a black kid in a black neighborhood upon seeing white cops come into the neighborhood, is that conduct suspicious? Now you might say, yeah, people don't flee when, you know, there's like the, the proverb or, or it, it's in the Old Testament. Um, the wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. And that's what a prosecutor or a police officer would say to you. The, 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 the wicked flee, the bold, innocent people stand firm. But think about that. Is that the way uh, a black kid in a, in a neighborhood when he sees police, is that his perception? Because there's another proverb that says a shrewd man sees trouble coming and lies low. You know? So, so, so you, know, it, you know, the perception of people in, in minority communities, and this perception is shown by statistical evidence overwhelmingly. They're scared. They feel they're intimidated. They're hostile to law enforcement because they know the kind of experience that they've had. And so if that's their perception and they're going to engage in furtive conduct when they see police, is that conduct suspicious or is it something that would be natural and normal for these kids uh, in this particular uh, setting? Now, I don't know the answer to that. This is very, very difficult. We're talking about a lot of uh, very close facts. It's a very fuzzy area. We know that racial profiling, if that's all it is, is bad. You know, but, but the police aren't going to say, I stopped him because he was black. They're going to say, I stopped him because he engaged in furtive conduct and he kind of looked nervous and he moved to the side when I was coming by. You know, and these are all objective facts. And uh, you know, judges and prosecutors are probably going to say, yeah, that's right. You know, I would like to know from Mr. Cutler, because he said that by and large, INS agents, DEA agents are, are by and large honorable and professional people. And I believe that, by the way. I believe that. And I have no qualm. But, I, but, but there are a number who aren't. And I'd like to know how many INS agents have been disciplined, prosecuted for engaging in racial profiling. I'd like to know how many DEA agents have been prosecuted for engaging in racial profiling. I'd like to know how many cops. You know, in New York, there was a study by the Attorney General's office a couple of years ago that showed that a black kid in a white neighborhood is six times more likely to be stopped than a white kid. A Hispanic is four times more likely to be stopped. Those kinds of statistics tell me that these cops are engaging in racial profiling because they're not using objective, credible reasons. They're using race as a stereotype. But I don't think that any of those police in this long, very, very voluminous study by the Attorney General's office have been disciplined in any way, shape, or form. Um, it's a tough problem. The remedies are not uh, there. Nobody gets prosecuted, and I can give you all the reasons why they don't get prosecuted. You know, uh, Mr. Cutler said that early on, their fear of being prosecuted is going to make them toe the line. Baloney. Well, I'll tell you what. <laughs> cops, cops and agents do get prosecuted. Perhaps not as often as you might think for they should. For racial profiling? For racial profiling? Well, it depends on what flows from it. Now, wait a moment. It depends on what flows from it. If you want, we could have a situation that exists in several communities around the country. Uh, Los Angeles had a problem with, with this sort of thing. And the cops resorted to the tactic of what they called a drive-by. No, they didn't take their guns out and shoot. They just drove by and waved and kept on going. Because every time they got out of the car, <coughs> allegations were made. You know, when an agent goes to work in the morning, that agent has three priorities. Priority one is you go home at night the way you came to work in the morning. Priority two, that you bring your, page home, your paycheck home intact. You don't get sued, fired, or suspended. Priority three is that you do the jobs that the taxpayers pay you to do in the first place. But only a darn fool is going to put a lower priority in front of a higher priority. If by doing your job you're putting your paycheck in jeopardy, then sometimes you put on blinders and you don't see what's going on. 
Are we being served by the cop who's afraid to be proactive? Now, if it's a belligerent, aggressive kind of an approach that the cop does, then we've got a problem, and he's probably wrong. But if, and again, presuming that there's nobody that they're looking for, the guy doesn't match any description, uh, and I, I had a bunch of those stops, I told you, when I drove that car. Most cops would pull me over, and they'd be very pleasant. They'd say, son, I got to tell you, a kid your age in that car doesn't add up. Where did you get the car? And they'll ask you that. And if you do it politely and in that fashion, that's fine. I had another cop pull me over and say to me, I know it's a stolen car, put your goddamn hands on top of your head before I break your head open. And he did it, and I had a girlfriend in the car in those days, and he was going for his blackjack. And I, this was a, a quick downhill spiral. And he said, I want your license. They said, yeah, if I take it out, are you going to claim I was going for a weapon? And so he said, all right, take it out. And what I took out were my credentials. It was an interesting experience. I've been on the other side of that. I have never <coughs> forgotten it. But what flows from the thing that catches your eye? How do you interact? If you see somebody who seems out of place, and you talked about those detectives, if you see somebody who then acts furtively, and you let him go, and there's crimes being committed, then you're not protecting the community. On the other hand, if you're curious, and agents are the most curious people in the world, sit on a surveillance, listen to the chatter on the radio, besides the girl watching, I will tell you that the level of curiosity about what's that car doing there, and why did that guy come back to that car three times, and what's in that briefcase, and we're talking about white people, by the way, because you're inherently curious. Investigators are yentas. We're nosy. We want to know what's going on. Now, what follows is what the issue is. If I see somebody who gets my antenna up and I approach him in an appropriate, non-violent, non-belligerent, non-hostile manner, that's one thing. If you grab a guy because he's, quote, the wrong color or whatever, and you throw him on the ground, you belong in jail. I had an old timer say to me, when you put your hands on somebody, you're doing one of two things. You're either arresting him or you're assaulting him. You better figure out which one you're doing before you do it. So if you simply walk up to somebody who, for whatever reason, has caused you to be curious, and you say to the guy, let me talk to you for a minute. What are you doing here? Where do you live? What's going That's fine, to my thinking. And as a young college kid, we used to get pulled over by the cops all the time that way. But if it's hostile and in your face and physical, <coughs> then, as far as I'm concerned, that law enforcement officer is wrong. I talked about the delicate balance. Part of it is a lack of sensitivity by some cops. But part of it is that, unless you've been out there, charged with the responsibility of enforcing laws and making arrests, it's hard to understand the mindset of the guy who wears that badge. So I'm telling you that that balancing act is always in the minds of, I would say, 90% of the people I've worked with. And by the way, if I found that it wasn't, I tried my best to not work with that person. And bosses are key, key in on this. And if you've got a guy that nobody wants to work with, he gets yanked in. And his potential for promotion, his potential for good assignments goes out the window. So maybe he's not in jail, but his career isn't going to go in the direction that I'm sure he wants it to go in. Just like anybody else, you have a job, you want to get promoted. You want the choice assignments. You want that good investigation. If you become a problem child, your career is going to suffer. And I think that that's one of the pressures internally that we put on people that, that go off the deep end. I hope that answers the question. Has this uh, stimulated any more questions before we uh, thank our, our excellent panel? Yes, right up there, two of them. This is uh, kind of off the topic of racial profiling, but goes back to an earlier question that Dr. Benke and Dr. Muir were commenting, commenting on. Um, I, it's just kind of a comment that I feel I have to make um, because I'm a closed-minded German Lutheran. Uh, that um, as much as I, I would agree that um, interfaith relationships need to be made and that especially we as Christians need to um, just show that we love one another in general as one of you know the two greatest commandments that Jesus gave us, I think that one of the comments was that there were um, things that really tie us together more than that they separate us. But the things that separate us, I think, are much more important than those little things. And I think that distinction needs to um, be made, and that you speak the truth in love, but when it's a matter of heaven and hell, that uh, we as Christians say that, you know, we, 
it's, you know, a, a big difference. And I, I just wondered if either of you two wanted to comment on that, agree or disagree. Well, uh, I think we should defer the final judgment to the final day. Let's just talk about the things that we're doing here before the, the final day. And I think that is what is important. Because each one of our faiths has been given a doctrine. Quran addresses that as a people of scripture, that each <coughs> nation that had a scripture were given a guidelines to, to perform and do their best. And on the, on the day of judgment, God will judge all these people for what they've what they done good towards humanity. And that is the, 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 the basic belief of Muslims that I'm sure that's what Dr. Benke was also alluding to. There's another question up there. Let me, let me, oh, let me take that somewhere. just for a second. I'll, I'll say that the, as I said before, you cannot deny my right to make the exclusive claim that I make, right, as a Christian. Yeah. By the same token, the, the, the Christian claim is always about good news in the end. And if I come across to people as, as raining hellfire and brimstone down upon them, obviously we're talking about ultimates. But if the way I put myself forward, especially at this time, is, is to end up telling this guy uh, that, that, he, he's, uh, that it's about hellfire and brimstone for him, rather than explaining to him that I believe in a God of mercy, I may not be able to get to the next conversation. I mean, the conversation may end right there, see? So that, that's sort of where I'm saying is let's keep the, let's <coughs> the place we can keep dialoguing. I, and I agree with that, I, and that's why I mean speak the truth in love. Yeah. But at the same time, I just, it, um, because other people are in danger of, of, of that, I, I guess growing up in Michigan in the Midwest where everybody is, you know, there's very few. Yeah, you know, New York is much different um, and diverse. And point being, I never had any idea that there were so many people that believed um, in, uh, for instance, just polytheism and, and the thought that, there's many gods or that there's one God and these are all different ways to go to heaven. I think a lot of people get confused when you use it, uh, you know, I don't know, if there's an overemphasis of, of love, not to take that away, but just if, the, if you overemphasize in order to um, continue the conversation with one person, it might confuse others. I just see a lot of other people as being confused um, partly because of that, maybe. Do we have another question you said? Yes, Who had the, yes go right ahead. Um, I have a question. now. Uh, basically, we're supposed to say, you know, racial profiling is like, isn't justified, it's basically wrong. But how do we stop that when the media basically takes a field day and says, well, like, there's one little problem, like there's a suicide bombing, and automatically, bam, like Muslims and Arabs or whatever is basically wrong. How do we tell the people, well, that's wrong, we're not supposed to, you know, be doing that and everything, and, and then automatically there's um, egotistical patriotics who will take that to their hand, well, I'm an American, automatically, you're Muslim, you're wrong. How do we stop that? Basically, if the media says, you know, helping everything out and basically making a big propaganda, because it's been in the history of the US, basically, of media expanding small things, of telling little lies. How do we stop that if we're supposed to stop racial profiling? Is the question really that uh, the media is misleading us, so they're not yeah. giving us the right emphasis? Is that the idea? Basically, the, the well, media. I, I think anyone here could, could take a stab Absolutely. at it. But I think that obviously the media, they have their right to say what they want to say, and the only way to get around that is to try to get other people to be spokesmen for these views that you want to have spoken. But you may have some other views here too. Well, I'll just, I'll just give you one idea, what I've told my kids. I have four kids, and we have great debates at home. Um, and what I've told them is don't rely on one source of news. Because I don't care who you're listening to. I don't care if it's ABC, CNN, NBC, Fox Channel, <coughs> the New York Times, Newsweek magazine. Everybody, you know, if, if there was a car wreck outside and there were 20 people who witnessed it, you'd have 20 different stories. So the smart thing to do, and, and you know, I, I, I've been the guest speaker at high schools and that sort of thing, and I tell people in a democracy, you need to work hard. See, dictatorships are very easy. All the important decisions will be made for you. They'll tell you where you can live and where you can work, if you can work, what you can eat, and so forth. When you live in a democracy, you get to pick the people that run the government. Okay? So you have to do your homework. How can you make an intelligent decision in the voting booth if you don't know the issues and don't know what the candidates stand for? How do you vote on referenda 
unless you're familiar with the referenda. So you need to do the homework. You need to get as many sources of news as you can find, and bright people will do it. You know, when I, when I listen to our esteemed panelists, and, and I agree with most of what I've heard this evening, ignorance is not bliss. When we narrow our minds and think our religion is the only way, my viewpoint is the only way, anybody who's that dumb, anybody who thinks he has all the answers probably has none of the answers. So if you go around saying, my way or the highway, that's the dumbest thing you're going to run into. It takes a bright person to understand that there are other perspectives and that other people may have a better idea than you do. And in retrospect, I look at things I've done and said, and two days later can't believe I had a particular position because I've, I found something different, a different way of seeing things. So the problem is, yeah, the media does screw things up, but to try to make sure you get it right, don't rely on one source of the news. I mean, that's the only thing that I could suggest. I don't know if anybody else has any comment. Yeah, it's but that's very how I feel I about ironic it. that the information is very much restricted in America. I must say that, you know, when I was growing up as, as a college student in, in Pakistan, we would listen to BBC, we would listen to Voice of America, we would read the, pa the, the papers that reached us maybe a month later from England, from, from America, to get the best news in the world as to make our own judgment. Here, the radio, we don't hear anything on BBC or any other station in Europe, or for that example, from Middle East or from any other country. So we have our own stereotyping of the, of the <coughs> news here that is sometimes very disturbing because you just hear only one viewpoint and you are not given all the opportunities to evaluate an event or a crisis that is taking place. Uh, you know, as people say, you know, the, the, the first, uh, you know, uh, uh, casualty of any kind of crisis or the war is the truth. And that is, you know, sometimes, you know, the second one is the conscience. And I think what we have to have is the truth and the conscience. I wanted to uh, thank Professor Gershman for getting us off to such a good start in defining the issues, and for Mr. Cutler for giving us really some, I think, fine insights into the INS. I wanted to, to uh, thank Dr. Meir for, for giving us uh, a good um, understanding, I, I think, and, and a uh, passion for knowing just how it is if you're uh, a member of a group where, where they've had these, um, these difficulties and, and some very intelligent statements. And then uh, I think uh, Reverend Dr. Benke, that he showed uh, a lot of uh, fine uh, insight as a, uh, as a minister of the gospel, showing what your uh, viewpoint was as to how we sh as humans should uh, behave together. I want to thank Concordia College for putting this together. And I want to thank the audience for being such a good audience. I think they're ready to go. I think they're ready to go. Oh, I like people to understand.